Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Ben Recht from UC Berkeley. He's going to talk about the statistical foundations of learning to control. Ben. Thank you, Amarly. Cool. All right, so this is um, it's kind of fun because a lot teed, teed off the discussion of controls for the day. I'm actually going to use the proper notation for state, so that'll be the big difference. But otherwise, we'll be covering similar ground. Uh, this is joint work with a great group of people at Berkeley. Um, uh, and it's been something that we've been working on off and on. I'm trying to remember when, because Laurent Lassard is here today. We started a reading group when Laurent was here. And so that means this has been a project that's been in the works for quite some time. Um, uh, and, and we kind of come, I feel like we're starting to make sense of this space. What space is that? Well, machine learning, as everybody knows, uh, is everywhere, it's ubiquitous, and people have been trying to put it in every possible place that they can, whether or not it's a good idea. And in particular, something that machine learning people are not really accustomed to think about is what happens when their systems start to interact with the physical world and what happen to interact with people. And what are the consequences for these systems that have to interact with physical objects? And um, of course, that means that now there starts to be certain safety concerns that, that come into uh, play. And not just safety concerns, but issues of reliability and, and scalability become really important as these things stop be, that start to press more and more into mission critical type applications. So the research challenge is broad. Making machine learning safe is very broad, but uh, also there's a kind of uh, particular uh, niche that we can start to apply, which is that machine learning systems that interact with the physical world also have the opportunity to collect data in ways that machine learning systems that are passive do not. And so the question is, if you have a system and it can be put out in the world and it can learn from its environment, um, what does this enable? And, and what are the kind of limits of these systems that interact with their environment? So that's a broad question again. So let's keep trying to narrow ourselves down to something tractable. Um, and, and one tractable thing is, or you know, seemingly tractable thing, would be just if I want to actually control a system, and I mean control in the kind of the same sense that Alad was talking about, which is having either a vehicle or having some object in the environment and be able to move that to a place um, where I'd like it to be or be able to operate in a regime that is safe, so ignoring disturbances from external factors, um, how much actually do I have to know about a system in order to do successful control? And this is a challenge that requires a lot of input from different areas, right? So on the one hand, there's classical control here, which has been working on this for a very long time. But then there's also incorporating classical control uh, with, with learning theory and the kind of advances we've made in learning theory, bringing those back to control theoretic settings. And of course, at, at its core, this ends up being an optimization problem because there are constraints that have to be satisfied at all times and yet objectives of achieving performance that we'd like to achieve. So just again, just to fix the correct notation for the problem, uh, with control theory is really just a system of dynamical systems with inputs. So for me, uh, the, the, the state of a system is essentially what you need to predict the future. Uh, it's the, it's the, the sufficient statistic needed to predict the future, and I'm going to call this x, uh, as is the convention in controls. And the input is what we get to apply to achieve the goal that we'd like to achieve. And this input is I'm going to label as u. Both u and x are going to be time series, uh, but they're going to be each be vectored. So x will be of dimension d, u will be of dimension p. And in this case, unlike what, uh, the, the situation that Alad presented, I'm going to assume that we could observe x, which makes the problem simpler in some ways, um, but I'm going to be much more concerned with control than identification in this, pro in this work. Um, so even, I figure if you have to understand what what we can do when we know what the state is before we have to worry about issues of what happens when we have to estimate the state as well. So optimal control, when optimization comes in, this is kind of a way to formulate the problem of how to achieve some objective given, in this case, just the constraints of dynamics. So the dynamics in this optimization problem, this is about the simplest thing we can do in control, the dynamics are what are the physical laws that govern reality and how can we choose inputs to, in this case, minimize some objective to achieve those, um, uh, un under those constraints. So here, the cost function, we've de decomposed over time. I note that if you maximize such a cost function, we would call this a reward, which is what would be in the context of reinforcement learning. Uh, 
which I'll talk about in a bit, um, tend to do reward maximization rather than cost minimization, but they're the same up to a side. ET is a second input to the system, and I'm going to assume this is some kind of disturbance, and for today I will always assume it's random, so some kind of stochastic disturbance, and hence this is now a stochastic optimization problem. FT is the state transition function that determines the dynamics of how the system evolves over time. And tau sub t is going to be a trajectory. Now I'm going to just lump into this trajectory both the inputs that have been applied so far and the states that we've seen so far. And the goal in optimal control is to come up with policies. Policies are functions that map trajectories into actions. Okay. And so we want to say, given what I've seen so far that has happened in the system, I want to then now apply a rule that gives me the next input that hopefully on this extended time horizon um, will solve the problem. Um, yes, fine. So, okay, it's good to just set up an example for people who maybe haven't seen controls before, and it's going to be a motivating example that we'll keep coming back to throughout the talk. Uh, let's say we would like to move an object from point A to point B under some kind of force. The rules for such, for such motion are given by Newton's laws, in which case ZT here could be our position, and the derivative of the position is velocity, and the derivative of the velocity is the acceleration, and force equals mass times acceleration. Those are our simple Newton's laws. We can combine these together and get an optimization problem. The optimization problem is now governed by the dynamics. I here have stacked the state to be the position and the velocity. Um, and the, the goal will be to minimize, a, essentially you'll pay a cost one. If you're not the target, you pay a cost zero if you are at the target. Now we could talk about how to solve this. And odds are, it's actually kind of a nice connection to Pablo's talk, odds are all of these problems in some sense should be solved by dynamic programming. Those will be probably the most efficient way forward here. Um, I haven't thought about this enough to know as to whether we would, this one is solvable simply by dynamic programming because of the structure of that cost function. But I do know one of the things as a control engineer you can do is just solve a slightly related problem and then see how well the related problem works on the problem you cared about. So rather than minimizing the number of time steps it takes to get to the origin, I can minimize the sum of the squares of the state. So if the state was zero, then I would actually be at the origin, and that would be fine. If it's not zero, I'm, uh, I'm going to pay some penalty, and that penalty will be larger than one um, far away. And this will serve as a surrogate loss for the problem I care about. And for my colleagues in machine learning, we know this is what we do in machine learning all the time, design surrogate losses that are evaluated on the losses that we actually care about. Right? In some sense, the study, a lot of what we do in machine learning is understand how surrogate solutions perform on the losses we care about. So it's no different in controls. And there's lots of other things I can do for design here. So for example, I could add a penalty on the input itself. I can add a quadratic penalty on the input. Um, and this R parameter here allows me to tune between whether or not I want to use a lot of energy or I'd prefer to use less energy, perhaps, to save the battery. And depending on what you pick, you're going to get different responses out, and you can now tune the parameter R, just as you would tune a regularization parameter in a machine learning problem, to get the desired performance that's acceptable for your application. Okay, so here we have just two graphs for showing what the position looks like over time, um, with a small value and large value of R, and similarly, how large the control action is over time. So if you'd like to have smaller control actions, you can have a larger R, but then, in this case, it will take longer to reach the origin. Okay. And there are also, again, as I said, there are lots of ways to solve this, but for a short time horizons such as 30, you, this is a quadratic problem with linear constraints, and you could just write down the system of equations to solve this yourself, which is nice. Um, but if you want to do a longer time horizon or higher dimensions, again, the, the best thing to do would be to use dynamic programming. Okay, so this example that I'm bringing up here is called the linear quadratic regulator. This is kind of one of the most commonly studied problems in optimal control. It's been studied since the 60s. Um, the reason why it's called the linear quadratic regulator is because the dynamics are linear and the cost is quadratic. Okay, so this is essentially the simplest one and we'll be using this as a baseline throughout the talk. Okay. Now, let's bring machine learning into the picture. We have the linear quadratic regulator. Now we want to come back to our general optimal control problem. I said that if you knew everything and you had a fast enough computer, you could solve this problem using dynamic programming. And there's a great two-volume 
sequence, probably for this problem, you'd only need the first volume of, uh, by, by Dimitri Bersakis on how to actually solve problems of this form. Um, but the pro how do we bring machine learning into this picture? Let's now talk about the situation when we don't know the dynamics. What happens when I don't know the dynamics and what changes? So now we have to do something. If we're just starting to solve this optimal control problem and I don't know the dynamics, um, it's not at all clear that I can solve anything until I do a couple experiments to get a feel for what the dynamics might be. What is the response to inputs and what happens with the states there? So I have to do some kind of learning or identification in order to um, uh, actually be able to take any action. Or at least I think I would. Perhaps there's some other way to directly get at this problem, get at this on an online fashion without ever even trying to fit a model. And so what's the right thing to do? How do you actually perform optimal control and what's the right sequence to perform optimal control um, when the system is completely unknown? Okay. So that's kind of the, that's the, that's the big question for today. How do we do optimal control when I don't know um, the dynamics? So the problem I like to use to motivate this, and I always, uh, this is uh, a very simple and toy example, uh, is the problem of data center cooling that uh, has been popularized by Google. Um, and Google DeepMind, for that matter, because they have, Google DeepMind has a, proposed a fairly radical way to solve this problem. Um, control theorists have a very boring way to solve this problem. They say this is an air conditioning problem, and it's very well studied. It's not clear that they're wrong, uh, but then the, uh, but if you call it data center cooling, it gets a lot more attention, and it makes you sound like you're closer to solving artificial general intelligence. So, the, uh, how would you do this, right? I don't know what the data center does. I actually, I do like this. I like this problem for the, for the reason that modeling a data center is really hard for a lot of different reasons. You have uncertain loads, the technology is constantly changing, they're adding TPUs and GPUs, you have different kind of hardware in different places, the, they're really big. The way that the cooling works and diffuses through this room is complicated. I could try to model the airflow like I would model a jet engine, but that seems like overkill. If I was a controls engineer, you know, and I was gonna take my standard heat transfer book, I would just use some kind of simple lumped model of heat transfer, and I would try some stuff, and I would build a couple uh, simple model prediction control system. And uh, I know Manfred is here, so I, I just, uh, this is kind of actually has been quite successful in air conditioning. Um, but if I actually have an agenda to sell, I'd probably be like a machine learning person, and I would say, look, maybe all I need to do is measure what happens at the sensors, and then measure what happens when I take an action, and then fit a neural network to that. Okay, so those are three extremes, right? So, so the one extreme is we model everything, and we use dynamic programming. The second extreme is we do something coarse that we know is approximate, and we use dynamic programming in some way in that capacity as well. And then the third way is we just learn what we would call a policy directly. Right? We just learn the policy directly. Given what the sensors say, find a function that maps sensors to action. And the question is like, are there regimes where one is better than the other? Like we know that for high performance aerodynamics, you really should have a very good model of your engine in order to actually push up against the limits of what your vehicle can do. Um, but we also know from most control apl applications that actually course models are really good. And the ability to constantly take action, which we call feedback, to be able to observe the world and do something with that is very powerful, and that allows us to somehow correct um, misspecified models. And this is kind of like the heart of the, the field called model predictive control and why model predictive control is so successful. But then again, there's this kind of idea that we just don't need models at all, that all we need is data. Right? And so what do we do in the regime where all we need is data? Right? And so, on the one hand, I was making fun of the DeepMind folks who are really into this kind of mindset of just simulating the universe um, with thousands of GPUs, uh, somehow cooling the data center as they heat it, and um, <laughs> getting to that equilibrium. Or, I kind of tagged this last one, I also wrote down PID control in this category. Because although, you, you know, we understand what happens in PID control, um, when we have a well-specified model, most of the time when we uh, deploy these in practice, we don't actually model much at all. Give me one slide because that's coming next. Good, good. Just in case, I'm ready. 
I'm ready. But the real question is, the real question is, we do need some notion of a way to distinguish which is the right thing to do here. So good. what is PID control? Well, PID control stands for proportional integral derivative control. And it's this really simple idea, and according to Carl Astrom, uh, and actually other people, but Carl likes to tell me about this, uh, probably accounts for 95% of the controllers that are in industrial production. So what is the proportional integral and derivative part? Well, the idea here is that you have some signal you would like to track to zero. So this could be the error of the, the difference between a true trajectory and a desired trajectory and the trajectory you're taking, or it could just be the temperature you'd like the room to be, and what's your error is just how far off you are from that temperature. There are a variety of things we can model in that way. And the way we build the control is we look at the error signal, how wrong are we? We compute its integral and we compute its derivative and then our control is just a linear combination of those three things. The error signal, the integral of the error signal, and the derivative of the error signal. So it's three parameters. And that's 95% of control applications uh, that, are, that are at least implemented in, in industry are, are, use this control. And actually, I think what's, what's interesting is almost all of those don't even use the, the derivative term. They only use the proportional term and the integral term. Right, so two parameters suffice for the, the vast majority of control applications. Um, and, and really, to, to deploy one of these, there are rules that never look at models, and that will work pretty well. Um, and so now the question is, if that's good enough for 95% of control problems, what about for this remaining 5%? What do we actually need? How much sophistication do we actually need um, to, to, to actually de to deploy these things in more general settings? And that's what I'd like to try to figure out. Okay, so, to make sense of this learning to control problem, we have an optimal control problem here. Again, we have a cost and we have some dynamics that are unknown, and we have a control signal that we're trying to learn, a policy we're trying to learn. And I'd like to simplify this problem to, so we can actually start to make progress, because I think in the general case, it's gonna be hard to say anything. So what's the simplest problem setting that we can get to where maybe we can say something very quantitative? So, Oh, right, before I get to that. Hmm. No, let me come back to that. I'm going to come back to that. All right, so let me talk about the simple thing, and then I'll talk about that Oracle model. All right, so the simplest problem for me, and this is actually something I think holds for all machine learning, so I like to say this in every talk I give, is to find the thing that's the linear case and see what happens there first. So let's see how we can reduce the problem to linear regression. If we could figure out what to do for linear regression, maybe that actually will give us insights for what to do for the nonlinear case. This doesn't always work. It certainly is true, though, if you have something that works, that somebody's deploying on the really hard problem, and then you apply it to linear regression and it doesn't work, then something weird is happening. That seems to be, always be true. The other way, the converse, not clear. But it does give us a way of actually trying to make some sense in this very complex world where there are lots of options in machine learning uh, of what the possibilities are. And this is essentially all my research group does anymore. Uh, <laughs> So let's apply that to control. In control, the simplest example, I think, is this linear quadratic regulator. You could probably get a little bit simpler, but it is a really nice target problem. It's also one that's useful in practice. It really is um, uh, kind of the backbone to, to a variety of settings of uh, uh, optimal control that are, are applied in practice. And so we're going to use this one today. And so to get to this quantitative point, I wanted to bring up this one last thing. So we're gonna look at LQR, it's kind of the simplest model, and we wanna put this in a framework where we can be quantitative about how much we have to know in order to control. So my oracle here will be, I will allow you to generate n trajectories of length t. So, you get, so trajectory is just you pick an input sequence, run it for length t, whatever, however you wanna do that input sequence. Um, and we'll allow us to do n of them, and we want to build a control that has small error with respect to if you knew the model. So if you knew the model, you could build a controller, and in particular for LQR, I can tell you what the optimal controller is. It's very easy to write down. Um, so I want to compare my error to that best if I knew the model, given a sampling budget of n times t. Okay. And you could change these rules later. I, don't, um, I just wanted to kind of put ourselves on, on one or, uh, setting for an oracle. Um, for example, it might be easier to run a longer time horizon. In fewer experiments, it might be easier to run lots of experiments for two steps. We, but I don't want to quibble about that, so I'm lumping those together today. And so the question is, what's the optimal thing to do in this setting? Or can we even come up with what the optimal thing to do is? What's the right amount of, um, what's the best budget you can get? Okay, so I now have added a limit 
think, hopefully didn't have that in the previous slide, but if you look now in the LQR problem, I want to look at what happens as we let time go to infinity. Okay, what I like about this is there's seldom that you actually know how long you want to run a control policy for. And so this is allowing us to account for almost all, you know, for, for what happens on the long time horizon. What's fun about this one is it's quite possible to have cost that's infinite. Right? On an infinite time horizon, you can have cost that's infinite. Uh, in particular, um, as, as a lot was pointing out, if you have A and A has eigenvalues that are greater than one or magnitude greater than one, and you don't have any input, so your, your U is zero, then the cost will be infinite because you're going to have something that will be uh, exponentially blowing up as time goes to infinity. Okay, so when A and B are known, the optimal policy is a static matrix that multiplies the state and gives you the control. So the, the, the new control, no matter what you did in the past, the new control is only a function of the current state. And it's a linear function, and it's a static linear function of the current state. Okay, and this, this you can derive. I don't have time, unfortunately, to go through this today. But uh, you could derive this via a variety of ways. You can just do it as an analytic limit, if you'd like. Um, or you can study something called Riccati equations, which actually will give you such a solution. And so maybe an obvious strategy, or like the first thing you might try, would be collect some data, estimate A and B, and then build the controller as if S, A and B were true. In controls, this is called certainty equivalence. Uh, in statistics, this would be called the plug-in estimator. Um, and so that seems like the obvious strategy, but perhaps, we, perhaps rather than doing that one, let's try something more ambitious and say, well, you told me that the optimal control should be static and linear. Maybe I'll just try to fit that control directly from data. So I could try, let's say, a very machine learning approach, do something like, I'm going to call it epsilon greedy. And my machine learning friends in the room, don't stop me because this is not really epsilon greedy. But if you know the answer, don't tell everybody what I'm actually doing here. Okay, so here's my greedy strategy, which is I'm going to build a control that's static. I'm going to assume that's true. So I'm going to initialize with some controller. Um, I'm also going to sample some vectors for exploration. So these new vectors are going to allow me some exploration. And what I'm going to do is have the current control K, like I would run that, but then I'm going to add to the current uh, control scheme a little bit of noise that allows me to move around. And then I'm going to compute the cost, and my update is going to be the old cost minus um, the new cost times the sum of the exploration vectors times the state transpose. Now you might be asking, where did that come from? You should be asking, where did that come from? It turns out that this is an algorithm called policy gradient. And policy gradient has been a very uh, popularized algorithm. People like to talk about proximal policy optimization and use this to lose badly at Dota. Uh, on the world stage, or whatever you'd like to do. But lots of people think that this can solve every problem, but you see for the, control, the quadratic control problem, it does look like a convoluted way that, do, that looks sufficiently more complex than the plug-in estimator. And in particular, just in case you're wondering, like, I don't see gradients. So it's really funny, like, the, what, what this is a gradient of is not at all clear, but don't worry about that, that's again for my... Anyway. I think the more important thing with policy gradient is that when you apply it to the simple problem, and this has been the problem we've been motivating of, of just moving an object according to Newton's laws, it has very high variance and takes a lot of samples in order to get a good solution. And so here what I'm plotting is just an experiment I ran, the code you can download and play with yourself if you think I'm implementing this incorrectly, um, if you want to try. There are lots of ways to fix policy gradient, um, and I had to do a bunch of them to try to get this to work. So you have to add something called the baseline, you have to use an algorithm called Adam or natural policy gradient to kind of lower the variance, and then I could get it to be here. Um, and it takes 30,000 samples to get something that's close to the true optimal value. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what is your dimension and how many you sample? Two. It's this problem. It's really like that, that, that one. Um, two, right? Okay, so you, I mean, you just observe the state, and then there's 30,000 samples. So the other, the other thing is, remember I told you this idea where I could just sample, I could just do a trajectory, fit the model, and then plug that in, and then treat it as if that was the nominal solution? Uh, you get there with 10 samples. Okay, so this, plug, this, this really dumb idea of just fitting the model with a little bit of data, plugging that in, works with 10 samples, but this algorithm policy gradient, which I'm told is going to solve artificial general intelligence, uh, 
takes 30,000 samples. And the question is, uh, that, that, seem, that seems ludicrous because I was told this would solve artificial general intelligence. Now, I think the thing is, right, we have to take all claims in machine learning with a grain of salt because it's just, you know, Lance Armstrong said this when he was accused of doping, right? So remember, it's only true if your prior is correct. And our prior might not be correct about these methods. I mean, actually, what's funny is that anybody who's worked in reinforcement learning before uh, we solved Go, Lance Armstrong. He's a cyclist. Yeah, anyway, it's good we don't know him anymore. Anyway. So anyone, who, anyone I talked to who's worked in reinforcement learning in the days before AlphaGo said, yeah, we're not quite there at making this work. But then, of course, we solved AlphaGo, and of course, it just, that means that we have solved AI, right? It's a jump. So how, how am I dismissing this, right? So I, I showed you a demo where it didn't seem to work. But it turns out if you actually read the fine print, like you go to the websites of OpenAI, they admit that reinforcement learning results are tricky to reproduce, performance is very noisy, algorithms have many moving parts which allow for subtle bugs, and many papers don't report all the required tricks. They say that RL algorithms are challenging to implement correctly. Good results typically only come after fixing many seemingly trivial bugs. And I guess that's fine because we are in this nascent world, right? But you don't want that in your car. Um, you don't want that in anything where there's something mission critical could happen. What I also found really compelling is there was a result done by some folks at McGill which showed that just by varying the random seed in the demos from these open AI baselines, you would get dramatically different results. Just changing one line, the random seed, gives you hugely different results using these policy optimization techniques. Here is just two different sets of five random seeds. It's a really widespread invariance. And that has crazy downstream effects because these codes are incredibly complicated. So in this plot, what I'm showing are three different implementations of the same algorithm and their optimization curves. This is three different plots of the same optimization algorithm by the same author. Right? And moreover, I gotta look at this detail here, the blue and the red are two, diff are two different timestamps of the same GitHub repo. This is a version one and a version two release. And of course this makes sense because if you refactor your code and your sensitive random seed, you're going to see crazy things down, down uh, just refactoring your code will show you the exact same effects as having the random seed. And my reaction is there has to be a better way. And I propose it to you, right? What about this other thing, right? So reinforcement learning has been this idea that that's the right way to learn how to control. We're just gonna look at the state and directly learn policies. And in some sense, that's called what I call model-free direct policy search. That's roughly the, the set of, of methods I would refer to there. Directly attacking the policy, treating it as a derivative free optimization algorithm, not reading any papers by people who've written derivative free optimization uh, papers. <laughs> Just going go to town. Um, there's another method that's a little bit, actually in a lot of ways, more sensible, I'm not going to talk about today, because uh, for limits of time, which is approximate dynamic programming. I know there are lots of people at Princeton who work on this, uh, which also has some promise. It's, th this one just actually tries to approximate the cost function rather than to approximate uh, the policy and solve that approximation and understand what errors you incur from such approximations. But let me talk about this third approach, which is just model-based. For continuous control, it actually seems quite reasonable that we can actually get enough data to actually estimate the model itself. And the model base would be you estimate the model yourself, itself and then use that as if it were the truth. Something along these lines. Let's say it this way. Model-based reinforcement learning. Um, we collect some simulation data and we'd expect that we could build a prediction function pretty well from the simulation data. A lot talked about this. For me today, I'm gonna to talk about something really much simpler because I observe the state. I can just solve the least squares problem. None of the intricacies of hidden states have to happen here. So this is a supervised learning problem. Um, and then I can solve an approximate problem, which is to just treat those dynamics as if they were true. It's called certainty equivalence, nominal control, uh, plug-in estimation. So how, how well does this do? And can we prove anything about this? I'm actually, even though I said I was going to do that, I actually want to propose something slightly different. The hard part with this thing of nominal control is that when you build an estimate, you don't really believe it's true. You believe it's an estimate. And so it should be possible to incorporate the fact that it's uncertain. So I want to propose something slightly different than certainty equivalence, which is what I'm calling course ID control, although this plot, this figure, if anyone does control, will also look familiar to them. Course ID control is fit your coarse grain model, fit the model to a little bit of data, but then use what you know about the 
the system to come up with an estimate for how accurate the model is. And once we've done that, we can now solve a robust optimization problem, which says that I, out of all the models that could be true, which is this g hat plus the delta, out of all of those models that could be true, let's come up with a control that should work well. Let's find the optimal control that works for the worst model in that set. And this is what we're calling course ID control. It's coupling, this, the robust control is the part where if I hand you the estimate and the delta what to do, the ID part is the actually estimating delta and the G. And the question is, can we put those together in an end-to-end -end way? What's course mean? Dimensions? Is it Hi, it's hand wavy. Hand wavy. Fitting a, fitting a model to data. Something simple. Yeah, I'm happy with that. <laughs> Something simple. So let's see how to do this. Let's see, um, I'm going to give you an example, and I have time to do both. Okay. I like this example where I can do it without time, because it's really easy. With time is actually not that much more complicated, except for the fact that you have to account for infinite series. So the, all the complication comes for bookkeeping and accounting for the fact that infinite series might diverge. But the method is just what I'm going to describe for one step. And the one, here's my one-step LQR problem. I want to minimize the, the, the cost subject to one equation. Okay, so for one step, and we assume that B is unknown, we can collect data. That's easy. And then we could do an estimate to minimize B. Uh, so minimize with respect to B, the least squares estimate, uh, given all that data. And this will give me an estimate, but using either something like the bootstrap or using large deviation inequalities, I can also estimate how close the true B is to the b hat. There's lots of ways to get good estimates of how close these two are without knowing it exactly. Then what I could do is just write down this very trivial equation, which says that, is there a question? No, just, okay. The trivial equation, equation which says that x uh, is equal to my estimated u, estimated b times u, plus x zero, plus my error in b times u. Again, this is just adding and subtracting b hat. Nothing fancy there. But just by rearranging those equations, I can now push the error, all the uncertainty, into the cost. So I can have my certainty equivalent dynamics, but now have a robust cost. Everything is now up in the cost function. And up in that cost function is my delta b. Okay? And uh, I'm going to now take the worst delta b out there, and that will be the cost I pay. So I'm going to minimize u subject to the worst delta b. Now, how do I solve the robust optimization problem? There probably are better and more sophisticated methods, but all we end up doing in this paper is essentially using the triangle inequality. Right? And so the triangle inequality will just pop out from the fact that um, there's nothing there. Right? We just use the triangle inequality and, and um, a priori information about Q. It turns out in the paper, because we have the infinite series, what comes out is, the, is a sub, is a sub multiplicative operator rather than the triangle inequality. But again, the whole idea here is push that out, I now have an optimization problem that doesn't have the delta B. That's my relaxation. And now I'm going to get a generalization bound for free. And a generalization bound is just going to tell me how, how actually accurate is the thing I solved for this approximate problem as compared to the true problem. And the, the way we get that is just noting that the truth is going to be feasible for my approximation. Okay. Once I put those together, I actually gets an end-to-end -end generalization bound. And you could prove this yourself just using the fact that the truth is feasible for the relaxation. Okay, so the relaxation is an upper bound. The truth is feasible for the relaxation. You rearrange some equations, you get this generalization bound. Okay, so what happens, let's, let me actually just state the theorems, even though I can't prove them, but the proofs are very much like what I said before, but now let's state the theorems for the infinite time horizon. So the first, we, we break this into two steps. We run the experiment, in this case just one experiment, to estimate A and B. So we're going to run for t steps and solve a least squares problem, which is just, you know, the, these are the equations that we should expect to be true, given this collection of states and inputs. And the input will just be random input. Given that random input, we, uh, uh, we can start this estimate, and we can guarantee a generalization bound of the following form. This one assumes that the matrix A is stable. We have another result when it's not stable. It's just not quite as pretty. It's actually easier to estimate in unstable systems, meaning systems that actually have uh, eigenvalues with magnitude larger than one than it is for systems where eigenvalues are less than one. But the, the equation is much cleaner in this case. Yeah? So when you look at the probability gradient, is that for the real system or for the estimated system? The real system in this case, 
because I wanted to give a bound on these errors, but you could do it the other way too. You can get it in either way. Okay. So machine learning people like to have these bounds which depend on the true system, but you might also want to have a bound that depends on the estimated system. There's symmetry in our results. You can plug whichever one you like. But the, to, to the folks at Colt like to really see the right hand side not depend on data. The, um, okay. And what it says here is that the larger the controllability gramia, the easier it is to estimate the system from one trajectory. Which kind of makes sense because what it's saying is that the system is easier to excite. So you're going to see more signal. I'm Riley, do you have another question? Ah, so it, I'm, I'm just saying you gave me a sampling budget. So that's going to be how much time I do to learn. So the budget is just to learn? Yes, the budget is just to learn. That was the Oracle model. Yes, that's a great question. I'll talk very, very briefly about the, the case when you want to do it online. But yes, the budget here is just to learn. Okay? That's more difficult, exactly. So I'm already say, saying, if, if I actually had a, a budget at, at which I want to do control over the entire time horizon, so now you have to, now you have to interleave identification and control. That's considerably harder. And I'll talk about that very briefly. Okay, but let's actually talk about what to do in this case. We're going to observe for time t steps. We have this estimate now. We solve this approximate problem, which I told you about, uh, taking the worst case instance of delta A and delta B in this case, which we were able to construct. And an SCP relaxation of this problem has the following end-to-end -end sample complexity, again, using this triangle inequality type uh, approach, which is that we get a scaling with respect to the number of states, number of inputs, that's, that's fairly reasonable, very small. Uh, in some sense, you can't estimate the system faster than this, so that's reasonable. And then we have uh, some parameters that depend on the system itself. The harder the system is to control, or more, the more sensitive the closed loop is, the more samples we need. Um, on the other hand, the more sensitive the open loop is, the less samples we need. And there's a trade-off between these two, which is pretty interesting. It's only an upper bound. I don't know if these are necessary, but I think that's also worth looking into what actual properties are necessary for control. But you can definitely demonstrate that these things are, they seem to capture the right behavior. And what's also cute is this tells you when your cost is finite. I and mean, that's important. Meaning this tells you when you have a stable interconnection. Which is very, I mean, that's what you want. So this tells you how, once you ha have collected enough samples, you can guarantee that you would actually have a stable interconnection using this method. If the SDP is feasible, you have a stable interconnection, assuming that you believe that your error of epsilon is true. Your, the estimate of epsilon is true. So let's just see what happens in practice, because why didn't I do certainty equivalence? I said certainty equivalence seems like a good idea, and then I went down this path of robust optimization. The problem is certainty equivalence had, well, we can find a couple issues where it doesn't work so well. Certainty equivalence, remember, was to estimate the system and then treat it as true. But the problem is, here's a simple, very toy model of the data center. It's not really, but it's a simple, it's a simple dynamical system. You see that on the diagonals, I have 1.01. So if I were to imply no control, this would have an infinite cost. Because that matrix exponential, uh, multiplied by itself enough times will be large. Uh, now, if I do a least squares estimate, and I don't have a lot of data, maybe I estimate one of those diagonals to be 0.99. And then what I'm going to say, if I'm Google, and I really want to have a flashy result, uh, I'm going to not turn on that fan, because it will save some energy. And then I'm going to have a fire. Okay, so that's the, that's the problem. So that's why the robustness really helps. If you have estimation problems, and they don't have to be caricatured like this, if you have estimation problems, you could prevent controlling in regions where you really do need to control. So that's where the robustness really helps. And we actually see this in our simulations. Um, here I plot, there are three curves. The blue curve is the robust LQR method when I tell the optimization problem the true error between A and A hat. The green curve is when I estimate A and A hat using the bootstrap. And the orange curve is the plug-in estimator, the nominal model. And what you see is that, that the blue curve and the orange curve are, are essentially on top of each other, or the orange curve is worse. The green curve is not that far off. And the important part is that in the second slide, this is the fraction of times that the system returns something which has finite cost, that the method returns something that has finite cost. Okay. And it turns out that the robust methods are returning things with finite cost with very few number of samples. And even after 600 samples, nominal, the, this plug-in method uh, is returning an unstable system 10% of the time. Okay. So the robustness really helps here. 
And just really quickly, I don't want to spend too much time on this, we tried these policy gradient methods and uh, we have to now multiply the axis by a factor of 10 and it's still even hard. There are too many methods on here. Model-free methods and approximate dynamic programming seem to have some issues on this problem. Let me, t I'm happy to talk about that more um, with you at, at, during the break. Okay, so a question, why has no one come up with such sample complexity results before? And this is actually, I had some conversations after a lot talk this morning that were along the same lines. Why has no one really kind of addressed these kind of sample complexity results before? I think there's, there's two reasons. One, machine learning is much hotter than it used to be, so I think that's one thing. Um, but definitely the, the results we're using for estimation to actually get these kind of results for one trajectory, we're using results that have been developed in like 2017. The high dimensional statistics is much more, much stronger than it was last time people were doing robust control. And I think that really does uh, make a difference for the kinds of quality of balance that we can get. And moreover, our SDP relaxation itself is using some really cool techniques developed by Nikolai Motney, uh, who's a postdoc in my group, um, that, that actually seems to be more efficient than some of the older robust control techniques in terms of running time, but also allows us this funny thing to actually push through the bound end to end to really get this result that allows us to get estimation error to control error in a kind of a very clear way. Okay, let me um, um, just really quickly, Amarali, this is for you. There actually has been a bunch of results recently in the high dimensional statistics literature and the learning theory literature trying to push at these sample complexity results for LQR that have pushed us along these lines. These have all been in the settings that Amar Ali has been talking about. They have been in the adaptive control setting. None of these actually lead to algorithms that you can run in practice, but we've actually followed this up with a, an algorithm using these techniques to actually get a sublinear regret for this adaptive control problem, which means that if you give me a time budget and you're going to penalize me at every time step for how good my control is, we can actually interleave the identification and control. Um, we've also just pushed a, pushed a paper to archive uh, talking about how to actually do this learning when you have constraints over where the object can be. So you don't want to violate constraints like your car, you'd like your car to improve its performance but not drive off the road. We can actually use this kind of same machinery there. And something I unfortunately don't have time to talk about today is actually then applying the, some of these ideas to the world of uh, reinforcement learning to this nonlinear neural net world. And actually even there we see that simple ideas, simple static linear policies and simple derivative free optimization methods are highly competitive with um, the, the, the current state of the art. Okay, I'll stop there. Um, yeah, I think that they we're really just starting to get a feel for what the right baselines are in this space. Um, simple algorithms do really seem to be competitive, but even these simple problems seem very hard to analyze. And I think that's kind of the fun part. And it's like there, there's a lot of fun math to do, and using that fun math, I really think we've been trying to start to deploy these things out in the world, and I think that they're actually going to start to have impact outside of, uh, the, of the uh, math papers. And so, anyway, it's an exciting time to work on these problems. There's lots, plenty of stuff left to do, and uh, happy to answer any questions you might have and, uh, about this stuff. Okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> this person seemed eager. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so the question is, what do you do for nonlinear models? Um, this is not, the, I think this is going to be on a case by case basis for nonlinear models. The problem with nonlinear control is that it just, just like with nonlinear optimization, it just means not linear. I feel like there's going to be something here, like what's happened in non convex optimization, where using ideas from LQR can allow you to push slightly into non convex problems. So, into nonlinear problems in this case. So, I think studying things like iterative LQR in this context are probably gonna be the nice, simplest way at it. So, so, do you need to so I'm not allowing follow-up questions, sorry. Oh man. Victor, you can ask later. Absolutely, 
I, I don't know, but I think yes. I think something along those lines of being able to actually learn the right spaces to probe is going to be the right strategy to get a more efficient algorithm. But I, like, your intuition seems correct, but we, we haven't, we don't know yet. Hung? Uh, so you are error when you make Yeah? Why should it be exact number? No, 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 no. It just has to be an upper bound. Any upper bound on that will be okay. Lower bound, you're in trouble. But any upper bound will be okay. And you can get an upper bound conservatively by perhaps using a bootstrap. There are lots of ways you could simulate even from the data you have to estimate an upper bound on that. You really just need an upper bound, not the exact. And we had that slide a couple back. Let me just go back to it here, where the green slide is estimated from, the green line is estimated from data, the blue line is estimated uh, using the exact number. So the blue line is actually, the green line is okay. Yes. Probably. I mean, I, we haven't looked at it at all. So I, I imagine why not. Yes. It might be cheaper to solve computationally. It might be cheaper to solve computationally is one thing, although our, the algorithm we have is actually pretty, for this particular small problem, is efficient. I think at, risk sensitive control would likely be more efficient as you start to add more complexity to the situation. Like if you add constraints or you add other kinds of uh, limitations on what controls you can do, I imagine that actually would be more tractable. And people definitely, like the, the ETH group, spends a lot of time looking at similar kinds of things. But we don't have, we don't have these kind of sample complexity proofs for those results as of yet. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna stop the questions here. Let's thank Ben again for a great talk.